I should say by way of, of um, introduction uh, that I, I'm apologizing for reading you a lecture, a paper that I'm in the process of writing. Uh, and I apologize for that because, of course, I know that the un Uncommon Core is supposed to be discussions and every other year that I've been involved in, in reunion and have uh, done an Uncommon Core session, it's always been a conversation about a text. Uh, on the other hand, in my defense, let me just say that this paper has emerged out of years and years of teaching the dialogues, primarily the apology, uh, and mostly to freshmen. Uh, so I think it's appropriate uh, that uh, you should hear what has emerged for me uh, over the last 10 or 15 years in thinking about the apology uh, seriously in the context of all of Plato and in the context of Western philosophy. Uh, it's, uh, well, so I'll, I'll uh, enough by way of introduction about a lecture. Anyway, my remarks today, this is a little uncomfortable, but you'll pardon me if I don't look up too much. My remarks today on Socrates, who was he and what did he do, represent the coming together of a number of ideas, puzzles, problems, and questions that I've been aware of for a very long time though not in any unified or coherent way. It's only very recently that I've even come to understand that what I had simply assumed was a disparate un bunch of unrelated ideas and problems were actually elements of a single whole. That whole has now taken shape in my mind as a story, a story composed of events and persons that actually lived. So in a way, it's a historical story. But right at the outset, I have to say that I don't know whether it's true or not. It may be almost wholly concocted, a fiction, if you will, akin to a historical novel like War and Peace. Now, War and Peace is about an actual historical event, the invasion of Russia by Napoleon in 1812, but it is also and essentially a fiction. And yet Tolstoy, its author, insisted that it was substantially true, truer even than the carefully researched factual accounts of all the historians, both Russians and French. So the story I want to tell you today is something like Tolstoy's novel, though told, I'm afraid, without Tolstoy's poetic genius. And my story is as yet unfinished. What I will talk about today is more like a preliminary sketch, a rather tentative early draft subject to much further revision and addition. <clears throat> Nevertheless, I think it's a fascinating and important story. Simply put, it is the story of the beginning of European, or as we say today, Western philosophy. Beyond that, I believe it is also an account of what philosophy itself is like and what it's really about. So with respect to the history, I think Alfred North Whitehead put, said it best in his great Gifford lectures, which were published as Process and Reality. And Whitehead there said very famously, the safest general characterization of the European philosophical tradition is that it consists of a series of footnotes to Plato. And Whitehead is right. Philosophy as we know it does begin with Plato, who seems to have grasped all of the fundamental issues and problems that have been the focus of philosophical reflection ever since. But that is already a very strange fact, because Plato, with the exception of his 13 letters, never wrote directly in his own proper person about his own ideas, theories, beliefs, his philosophy, if you will. Instead, he wrote dialogues, dramas, philosophical dramas, to be sure, but dramas in which only his characters talk, never Plato himself. And with the single exception of the laws, where he is absent, the dominant figure in all of his dialogues is Socrates. Now, at this point, I need to remind you that Socrates was a real person, apparently a vivid, idiosyncratic figure who made a powerful impression on many of his contemporaries in Athens and all around the Greek world. He was already quite famous in his own day and was frequently written about and often turned, to, turned into a literary figure by writers who knew him. The earliest contemporary image of Socrates that has come down to us intact is a typically broad and vulgar comedy by Aristophanes, The Clouds, which was written and produced about 425 BC, about 25 years before Socrates was indicted, tried, convicted, and executed for impiety by the Athenians. Now, Aristophanes' portrait of Socrates is something of a scandal because it portrays the great Socrates, the immortal martyred hero of philosophy and freedom of thought, 
as the disreputable, foolish founder of a school of rhetoric where young Athenians are taught how to ta take any side in an argument, no matter how preposterous or immoral, and to win. Beyond his concern for teaching a scurrilous rhetoric devoted to pro promoting injustice, Socrates is portrayed by Aristophanes as spending his days dismissing the traditional Olympic gods and proclaiming new gods such as vortex and clouds and investigating absurd questions of natural philosophy such as whether a flea hums through its mouth or its anus. In short, in Aristophanes' portrait, Socrates appears as a fraudulent, dishonest, relativistic, and atheistic sophist. Could any part of this picture of Socrates be true? A shocking question, but the answer remains to be seen. In any event, for the past 2,500 years, when we quote Plato, the simple truth is that we are almost always quoting the words of Plato's character, Socrates, not Plato himself. Now, of course, Socrates was a real person, an older friend of Plato's, who lived in Athens all his life until he was executed for impiety in 399 BC. And unfortunately, for the veracity of my story that I'm going to tell you today, the historical Socrates apparently wrote nothing. So that apart from Aristophanes' slanders, if that's what they are, all we have are the accounts of others, mostly his younger friends and admirers like Plato. Apparently, there were a good many such accounts, but only two have survived. Plato's and Xenophon's. Of the two, it is Plato's dialogues, overwhelmingly, that have served in Whitehead's phrase as the fountainhead of Western thought. So the historical question is, to put it very simply, how accurate is Plato's portrait of Socrates? The question, obviously, is unanswerable, because we have no contemporary substantial and serious accounts of the actual thought of the historical Socrates. We have only Plato's and, secondarily, Xenophon's rather different portraits. However, there is at least one thing we can say with some assurance about the historical Socrates. He was a major figure in the development, even the transformation, of Greek thought in antiquity. It appears that in addition to Plato and Xenophon, and after them Aristotle, Almost all of the major schools of philosophy in the later classical period claim Socrates as their founding thinker. The Stoics, the Cyrenaics, the Cynics, the Skeptics, every one of them pointed to Socrates as the origin of their particular philosophical position. I don't know exactly when the distinction between pre-Socratic and post-Socratic thought was made, but I believe it is not a modern but an ancient distinction that was already commonplace in late antiquity. That is, Socrates was accepted as somehow or other a transitional and powerful figure. So whatever it was that he said and did, Socrates was already seen both during his lifetime and afterwards as a pivotal figure in the history of philosophy. On that point, all the thinkers and philosophical schools agree from the immediate post-Socratic schools of antiquity right down to the present, to Heidegger, if you will. And so, in a slight modification of Whitehead's epigrammatic history of Western thought, philosophy begins not with Plato, but with his older friend Socrates. But, and to this extent Whitehead is obviously right, when we think of Socrates, we're primar primarily thinking of Plato's portrait of him in the dialogues. And that's what I'll be doing in these remarks today. Whether or not that portrait is historically accurate, it is that portrait, not some speculative image of the historical Socrates, that has largely defined for us the beginnings of our tradition of philosophy. And it is the Socrates of Plato's portrait, a fictional Socrates, if you will, with which I'm concerned in these remarks today. Now, Plato's dialogues do more than give us, however, a compelling picture of Socrates. They also vividly represent the complex social, political, historical, and intellectual context in which Socrates lived and thought. For that context, for the context of that life and thought, there is, first of all, and perhaps most important, Athens, the great democratic imperial city of Pericles, which Socrates almost never left. Among those Socrates encounters in Athens, there are the young men of the city, mostly of wealthy, powerful families, young men who are entranced by his conversations. There are also the established writers and other members of the cultural elite of Athens, dramatists like Agathon and Aristophanes, who seem to have accepted Socrates as one of them, even though he was impoverished uh, and had no known way of making a living or nobody knew what exactly he did. There are other older established fathers of the young men, 
the solid citizens of Athens, who Socrates cross-examined and who were increasingly uneasy, ambivalent, and finally hostile to him. And most important for my story today, there were the sophists and other early thinkers whose writings were sold in the marketplace and who flocked to Athens, the great city of ancient Greece, forming the explicit intellectual context of Socrates' philosophical career. Unlike Socrates, these men, the sophists and the earlier so-called pre-Socratic philosophers, wrote a great deal, but unfortunately almost none of their works has survived the centuries intact. And what now exists for us are only scattered fragments, phrases, sentences, sometimes a brief passage or two that has been preserved in the writings of later thinkers. But despite that fragmentary historical record, we do know a, quite a bit about the sophists as well as some of the so-called pre-Socratic thinkers. And we know it because in the dialogues we have many powerful dramatic renderings of Socrates' encounters with these people. So like our picture of Socrates, our sense both of the sophists and of the pre-Socratic philosophers is heavily dependent on what we see and hear about them in Plato's dialogues. Both the pre-Socratic philosophers and the sophists have evoked a great deal of thought and speculation among modern scholars. I begin with the earlier figures, the pre-Socratic philosophers. Without going into detail or engaging in any of the many controversies about the thought of the pre-Socratic thinkers, we can make a few general points about which there's not much disagreement. The pre-Socratics flourished, traditionally beginning with Thales in the early 6th century, down to figures like Anaxagoras, who was an older contemporary of Socrates in the middle of the 5th century. These so-called pre-Socratic thinkers never constituted a single school of thought, and they lived individually scattered along the fringes of the Greek world on the islands of the eastern Aegean and the coast of Asia Minor, and in the west in Magna Graecia, that what is now southern Italy and Sicily. They seem, each in their own way, to have been highly skeptical of the traditional Greek religious cults, as well as of the existence and efficacy of the Olympic gods, as portrayed in the poetic tradition of Homer and Hesiod. They were not scientists in our modern sense of the term, but they were seriously interested in a wide range of natural phenomena, such as eclipses, the cycle of the seasons, weather, mathematics, and so forth. But deeper than these particular phenomena, they seem, as a group, to have been primarily concerned to find and to articulate the underlying, permanent, and unchanging reality that gives rise to all the phenomenal changes of the natural world, the world in which we live, all of us. Now, these thinkers were, in the language of Aristotle, physicists, that is, students of nature. Physis is the word term for nature. That is to say, students of the things that exist and happen of themselves without requiring human intervention. Furthermore, given their primary interest in nature, the pre-Socratics tended to ignore or to even to deny the significance of the human things, the many diverse communities in which men live, the variable beliefs and customs of the many different peoples, the changing values and concerns of individuals. The pre-Socratics tended to turn away from this whole realm of human experience in their attempts to grasp the underlying and unchanging realities of the cosmos as a whole. Parmenides famously says in his poem, and this is one of the few fragments that has come down to us, and this is a quote, for never shall this be proved that the things that are not are, but do thou hold back thy thought from this way of inquiry, nor let custom born of much experience force thee to let wander along this road thy aimless eye, thy echoing ear, or thy tongue, but do thou judge by reason the strife encompassed proof that I have spoken. Notice the entire rejection of our ordinary sensory experience in favor of reason. So the pre-Socratics define their project by distinguishing it sharply from the ordinary everyday contingent and sensory experience and concerns of human beings. I'll come to the sophist shortly, but first I need to say something more about Socrates' relation to these pre-Socratic philosophers as it is portrayed in the dialogues. There are four major dialogues that are devoted directly to portraying the thought of these philosophers. The Parmenides, the Timaeus, the Sophist, and the Statesman. These four dialogues share an unusual and unique feature that distinguishes them from all the other dialogues of Plato. In each of them, Socrates does not dominate the scene, 
and he doesn't lead the discussion. For the most part, he listens politely and without interrupting, while the visiting philosopher displays his own thought in his own characteristic way. In the Parmenides, Socrates, who was portrayed there as a very young man, perhaps 18 or 19 years old, Socrates encounters the very old Parmenides. In a very brief conversation, an introductory conversation, Socrates uses his theory of ideas to refute an argument presented by Parmenides' companion, Zeno. And then Parmenides himself cross-examines Socrates about his theory of ideas. And he presents Socrates with a series of arguments that utterly devastate the theory. I mean devastate it. Socrates doesn't know what there are ideas of. He doesn't know if there is a single idea of each thing or an infinite series of them. He doesn't know how or even if the ideas relate to the sensible things of this world. And he doesn't know whether or not we can even know them at all. Now here I want to note parenthetically that in the ensuing 2,500 years of Western philosophical reflection and argument, no new or better argument has ever been advanced against the theory of ideas. But that's another story altogether. Now, following his brief but devastating series of arguments, Parmenides then asks Socrates an interesting question. What will you do about philosophy, Socrates? Where will you turn while these difficulties remain unresolved? And Socrates answers very simply, I don't know. The remaining and larger portion of the dialogue then consists of Parmenides showing how Socrates, being very young and inexperienced, needs to learn how to philosophize. And he does this by giving Socrates an example of a philosophical exercise, which he recommends to Socrates. The exercise consists of eight logical arguments considering Parmenides' own principle that the one is, whatever that means, don't ask. Upon examination, it turns out that whether the one is or is not, the others both are and are not, both appear and do not appear to be all things in all ways, both in relation to themselves and in relation to each other. That's the literal conclusion of the dialogue. For what it's worth, it seems to me that in the guise of a philosophical exercise, Parmenides is actually presenting Socrates with a complete formal logical account of his own understanding of the intelligible, rational structure of being. But in any event, Socrates listens to the so-called exercise and says nothing. And in none of the other 34 dialogues of Plato which feature Socrates does he ever attempt to do anything remotely like what Parmenides does here. In the Timaeus, on the other hand, and by contrast, the, on the occasion of the Panathenaea, the great uh, celeb annual celebration in honor of Athena, Socrates and some other Athenians are hosting a group of foreign visitors. On the previous day, Socrates entertained them all with an account of a conversation about politics, about how cities and their citizens should be organized. As he summarizes the discussion, it appears to have been more or less identical to books two through five of the Republic. But in any event, on this, the second day of the festival, it's the turn of the visitors to entertain Socrates. Timaeus, an eminent physicist and philosopher from southern Italy, probably a Pythagorean, proposes to give an account of the cosmos as a whole. So what follows for the rest of the dialogue is an intensely compressed mythical account of the orderly systematic creation and functioning of the entire cosmos as a whole and in detail down to the creation of man, the lower animals, and all of the various disorders and diseases that afflict them, and how to prevent or cure them. It's an astonishing performance in which in a single extended myth, Timaeus summarizes the entire contemporary Greek scientific understanding of the cosmos and everything in it. Again, Socrates listens without comment and never attempts to do anything like that in part or in whole in any of the other dialogues. Finally, near the very end of his life, in the very brief period between his con conversation with Euthyphro on the day that he was indicted and his trial a few days later at which he was convicted and condemned, he was present at two conversations which are reported in the Sophist and the Statesman. The interlocutors in these dialogues are two brilliant young mathematicians, Theotetus in the Sophist, and his good friend, a young man who was strangely enough named Socrates in the Statesman. He was an actual figure. 
The discussions which seek to define the two types, the sophist and the statesman, are conducted not by our friend, the elder Socrates, but by a visiting philosopher from Elia, the town in southern Italy where Parmenides had lived. This unnamed Eliatic stranger, as he's called, leads each of the two young men in turn through an extremely complicated but more or less systematic discussion culminating in each dialogue with a definition of the figure in question. Again, Socrates listens without comment except at the very end of the second dialogue when he praises the Eliatic stranger for the excellent portraits he has composed of the sophist and the statesman. The definitions of the two figures, sophist and statesman, are thus, according to Socrates, the product solely of the Eliatic stranger, not the just joint product of his conversations with each of the two young interlocutors. And that seems a fair judgment, since the stranger has a method that he calls division, which he uses throughout his conversations to elicit the answers that he's looking for from his interlocutors. That's a trick that every teacher knows, right? And that in each dialogue finally result in a definition of first the sophist and then the statesman, the definition that the Eliatic stranger is looking to produce. Now, in these four dialogues, then, Socrates is largely cast as a silent auditor, while a visiting philosopher displays his own particular philosophical method and central philosophical concern. Parmenides uses something like formal logic drawn from the commonplaces of ordinary everyday discourse to present a comprehensive account of the structure of being, an ontology, to use the modern term, a logos of being, if you will. Timaeus uses the devices of traditional poetry in a myth to present a, a, a scientific account of everything that exists as it emerges in the creation of the extended cosmos. And the Eliotic stranger can lead a bright but inexperienced young thinker to the definition of a difficult figure like the sophist or the statesman by the systematic application of a philosophical method of investigation. And of course, he has to do it twice because otherwise you wouldn't know there was a method. And he uses the same method in both dialogues. Socrates greatly admires all of these, all, th all three philosophical interlocutors, especially Parmenides. But he apparently does not ever attempt to follow their lead. Why not? To begin to answer that question, we need to turn now from these pre-Socratic physicists to their successors, the sophists. Towards the end of the pre-Socratic period, in the early and mid 5th century BC, the sophists emerged. Men like Protagoras, Gorgias, Prodicus, Hippias, Thrasymachus, Dionysiodorus, and Euthydemus, and their followers. They seem to have been interested in exactly those aspects of the world that the pre Socratic thinkers had bracketed as irrelevant and distracting to their concern for the unchanging nature of things. The sophists were highly individualized thinkers but they do seem to have constituted, at least as portrayed in the dialogues, a kind of diverse, wide-ranging intellectual movement, if not a school, at least a movement, during the fifth century BC. Unlike the pre-Socratics, moreover, the sophists are everywhere in the dialogues. <clears throat> Protagoras, Hippias, Gorgias are Socrates' central interlocutors in dialogues that are named for them. But almost every single dialogue seems to have some explicit or implicit reference to them to their ideas and to their influence. Socrates himself is often confused with or identified with them as if he himself were one of them. On the other hand, the Platonic Socrates is often seen by modern scholars as confronting and challenging the sophists, both individually and as a group. They are sometimes described and treated by Socrates in the dialogues as a permanent counterforce to philosophy, as negative, confusing, and corrupting both to decent politics as well as to genuine philosophy. One strand of modern scholarship claims that, so that Plato <coughs> was a, uh, a, 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 a radical conservative who systematically declaimed, defamed, and distorted the sophists and their movements, and that the sophists actually constituted a kind of prefiguring of the modern liberal enlightenment. There may even be some truth in this view of them. But rather than get into that kind of argument, I want to point out some things about the sophists that are generally accepted as true but are frequently minimized or ignored altogether in the modern account of them. First of all, it appears that the sophistic movement, which largely dominated the intellectual life of Greece in the fifth century, did not survive the emergence of Socrates and the post-Socratic schools of thought in the fourth century. 
On the other hand, if Socrates and behind him Plato was an enemy of the sophists and wished to refute them, how come the good burghers of Athens never seem to have grasped that because they constantly acted as if he himself was one of the sophists? In the dialogue, Socrates often speaks of the sophists in an admiring manner, and sometimes he even recommends them as teachers to some of the young men that are around him. In the Republic, where he handles Thrasymachus rather roughly in Book 1, he speaks of him later in Book 6 as having become his friend. In the Euthydemus, he seems to delight in the outrageous defective arguments of the two sophists of that dialogue. He speaks approvingly of Prodicus, the ultimate pedant, in the Protagoras. More to the point, in the dialogues, roughly speaking, Socrates treats the sophists pretty much the same way he treats everyone that he encounters. He cross-examines them, not with hostility, but rather in a serious attempt to uncover and test the validity of their opinions. And that was apparently not an easy thing to do. But there is a difference between Socrates' conversations with his fellow Athenians and his conversations with the sophists. This is because the sophists do not merely express their opinions about whatever it is that Socrates wishes to examine. The sophists are professional teachers and thinkers, and they claim to have the ability to teach others how to be successful in politics. In truth, they teach the art of rhetoric, the art of persuading others, the art which enables one to take any given issue and successfully to defend or refute either side of the question. Individually, each sophist tended to have his own particular interests and his own version of the techniques of persuasion. Prodicus, for example, was interested in words, in defining them, in distinguishing them precisely the difference between words of closely related meanings and determining how to use these differences rhetorically. Gorgias seems to have, been, have focused on rhetoric as a kind of morally neutral universal art of persuasion crucial to success in every human situation, even medicine. Thrasymachus, by contrast, behind his overt defense of hard-headed realpolitik, seems to have considered rhetoric to be the key to a successful career as a tyrant. Hippias was a kind of polymath, interested in and master of all sorts of different arts and techniques, which he displayed in rhetorical performances. Euthydemus and Dionysodorus treated rhetoric as a kind of martial art, in which one fought battles using words and arguments instead of swords and shields. Protagoras is the exemplary sophist. He stands out among all these diverse individuals in several respects. In the dialogue named for him, he slyly, though perhaps accurately, claims to be the first of the sophists, the founder of the profession and its art. And at the outset of his long, complex conversation with Socrates about whether or not virtue can be taught, he responds to Socrates' skepticism about the possibility of teaching virtue with a myth and an argument that not only defends his position, but does so in the form of a comprehensive philosophical account of the nature of man and his place in the cosmos. At the very beginning of the sophist of the dialogue, the Protagoras, before he narrates his conversation with Protagoras, whom he has just left, Socrates, talking to an unnamed friend, describes him admiringly as the wisest of living men. That is, immediately after leaving the conversation with Protagoras, Socrates meets a friend and to, and who asks him what he's been doing. He says, I've had a conversation with Protagoras, the wisest of all living men. At the end of the dialogue, however, after he has driven Protagoras to admit that he was wrong in his account of <laughs> courage, Socrates goes out of his way in his concluding remarks to assert explicitly that both he and Protagoras were equally bested by the argument. Socrates' rather inaccurate remark by describing the outcome of the dialogue as a draw serves to protect Protagoras from the public embarrassment of having been bested by Socrates. And he does that clearly. Why does Socrates do that? The beginning of an answer, I believe, is to be found in Protagoras' great speech near the beginning of their conversation, in which the old man sets forth in extremely compact form his comprehensive understanding of the human condition. And it's to that that I want to turn. Without going into too much detail, let me summarize my understanding of Protagoras' account of the nature of the cosmos and the nature and condition of mankind within it. Protagoras presents his account in the form of a myth. But before he begins, he asks his audience if they would prefer a myth 
or a logos, that is, a story or a rational account. But before they can respond, he says that he'll use the mythic form because it's more entertaining. But it's clear from his remark that he has a logos, a rational version of the myth. So I'm going to try, in my summary, to translate the myth into that rational account. Protagoras apparently proposes three stages of human historical development. First, there is the original primitive natural order in which the earth is inhabited by a large number of distinct species of animals, all but one of which are equipped by nature to survive the dangers posed by other species and the environment. Some animals, like rabbits, are small and easily caught, so they are prolific. Some animals, others, I would say, like foxes and wolves, prey on rabbits and are less prolific, but they are equipped with speed to overtake and with big sharp teeth to catch and eat rabbits. Both rabbits and foxes, on the other hand, are furnished with fur coats to keep them warm in the winter. In effect, the original order of nature, according to Protagoras, is a relentless, unending war of all against all. But this is not a Darwinian evolutionary account of the constantly changing survival of the fittest, because apart from one exception, each species is adequately equipped to sustain itself as a species, despite the loss of many individual members. The Protagorean nat natural order as a whole, therefore, <clears throat> despite the, Im the unending struggle for individual survival, is a balanced and stable universe. For all species of life, that's true, except for the one most vulnerable of the animal species, mankind. Humans, according to Protagoras, are the great exception. They are without armor like turtles, or without great size like elephants, or large teeth like wolves or great speed like cheetahs. So humans are not good predators. But neither are they small enough to burrow like rabbits, nor are they equipped with wings like birds to fly from predators. So they're not capable of escaping predators. And finally, they don't even breed very rapidly in large numbers either. They don't even have fur coats against the wild. Humans are the only species of animal naturally deficient as a species in the means of survival. This, I think, is a fair account of Protagoras' view of the natural order. Nevertheless, he goes on, men somehow or other had the wisdom before they were exterminated to invent and to practice the artificial, that is, the unnatural arts of working with metal and with cloth and other soft materials along with fire. The invention of the mechanical arts introduces phase two of his account of the human condition, what I call the technical order. Humans, he explains, had the compensatory wisdom necessary to find artificial ways to sustain their species in the face of their natural deficiencies. The capacity, the wisdom to invent and practice the arts appears to allow humans to surpass nature. And so, Protagoras implies, it gives men the sense that this wisdom is supernatural, that is, divine. So, he says, these primitive men raised altars for sacrifice and made images of the gods to celebrate and give thanks for what appeared to them to be the gifts of the gods. Of course, it's actually their own inventive genius. And having learned how to invent things, men go on to invent speech and language, to construct homes, sew clothes, make shoes, practice agriculture. Living dispersed, however, they are still caught and eaten by their predators, because without the art of war, they can't fight effectively against the wild animals. They want to live collectively to preserve themselves, but when they try to do so, he says, that is, when they gather together, but without the art of government, which includes the art of war, they disagree and they fight and are unjust to each other, and so they disperse again into the dangerous wild. This is Protagoras' view of the technical order. Initially, it consists of inventing the simple, obvious arts, agriculture, weaving, cooking, carpentry, pot, pottery, and so forth, the arts that are more or less necessary for human self-preservation. But men not only need to invent the arts to survive, they also need to deploy them successfully. And this, at first, they fail to do. The reason for that failure is pretty obvious. The arts and crafts are the domain of specialists, each of them, because it, it takes a distinctive aptitude for each craft, plus extensive special training, in order to perform it well. So no single person can master all the crafts that we need to survive.
Therefore, we specialize. One person learns to farm to provide us with food. Another learns to make shoes for our tender feet. A third builds houses for us to live in. However, we all of us need the products of each of these arts, so we not only invent the arts, we have to figure out a way for all of us to enjoy the fruits of all of the arts. This is a problem which, according to Protagoras Smith, the technical order by itself apparently cannot solve. So we need to hold the solution to the problem of human survival, that is the problem of how to deploy the technical order to the third phase of human progress. But before we go there, it's important to see just how far-reaching and radical the ra rationally insightful Protagoras conception is of the nature of technical innovation and its role in human life. It is the human capacity to invent the crafts, to make their products, and to continuously improve them that makes possible not just our ability to survive the endless strife of the natural order, but literally to transform human life in ways that radically alter the character of our natural condition. Just look around you, at this room for example, and think about all the ways in which your life is now radically different from the life of that small group of naked upright apes that wandered out of Africa about 50,000 years ago. Our nature has changed little if at all since then, but the very quality and character of our lives is radically different. The difference is almost entirely due to the extraordinary ability of humans to focus on some need or desire and to invent something that will meet the need or satisfy the desire. As Hannah Arendt has put it, we now can act into nature itself and manipulate it to serve our purposes, whatever they may be. Nature thus no longer seems to be an unchanging, limiting factor in our lives. That is exactly how powerfully the technical order transforms reality. The third and final stage is what I call the moral political order, in which according to Protagoras, humans finally figure out how to make effective use of the power of the technical order to bring about the transformation of their lives. The solution to the problem is to invent a way for everybody to share in the fruits of the technical order without having to master each craft or each art themselves. The solution is simply to create a community to find a way to bring men together in a cooperative enterprise and to create the glue that will hold them together peacefully. The creation of the community is the single most significant event in all human history. And Protagoras describes it mythically as the double gift from Zeus to all of mankind of reverence for the gods and justice towards each other. Reverence for the gods and justice to each other. The excellences, that is the virtues, which men display in the practice of the arts and crafts are the possession of the few spe specialists in each art. But reverence and justice, according to Protagoras, are excellences, that is virtues, which must be shared commonly by all the citizens of a community or the community will dissolve. The moral order, like the arts of the technical order, is an invention, a creation. But this invention, he insists, is not the preserve of a few specialists. It is the commonly shared glue that serves to hold together in a single integrated whole the disparate skills and qualities of the citizens of a polis, an independent, self-governing community. By now it should be clear that behind the mythical divine elements that shape his quasi-historical myth, that is the art stolen by Prometheus and the virtues given by Zeus, Protagoras does have a rational argument, a logos, that amounts to a functional account of the human condition. It goes like this. We need the arts to overcome our natural deficiencies, but we need the polis, the human community, to reap the benefits of the arts. The arts require specialized skills. The community requires the acceptance of a common view of justice. This understanding of justice is fully articulated and embodied in the laws of the community. The laws are seen in the myth as divine, a gift from the gods, worthy of our reverence. This, of course, is the way ordinary, unsophisticated citizens think of justice, and it ensures that the inhabitants of the community will accept the authority of the laws to govern their lives. In the argument which follows the myth, Protagoras casually, but quite candidly, acknowledges that the laws are actually the creation of a few wise human legislators. So it turns out that the moral order created by the laws is no less a technical invention of human wisdom than the specialized arts and crafts. 
But the moral order doesn't function to meet a particular need or desire. It is the overarching creation, invention, which creates a human community that makes possible the commodious, enlightened life of civilized men and women. This, in brief, is Protagoras' comprehensive account of the human condition. We can now begin to understand the project of the sophists and its relation to the philosophical reflections of the pre-Socratic thinkers. Those pre-Socratic thinkers were interested in the fundamental unchanging ground of all things. They were not interested in the diverse and constantly changing beliefs and customs of men and their communities. They were interested in what was permanent, not ephemeral, and what was true, not in what men simply believed in. In short, the pre-Socratics were not interested in the realm of doxa, of opinion. They wanted to know what was real, not what was merely apparent. <clears throat> the pre-Socratics, in making each in their own way the distinction between the real and the merely apparent, between, on the one hand, nature, which is rational and presumably can be known, and on the other hand, ephemeral beliefs, which are merely opinions, the pre-Socratics, for the first time in making this distinction, sharply distinguished those two realms. And it was exactly the realm of opinion on which they turned their backs. It was on that realm that Protagoras, the first sophist, saw could be explored, analyzed, and manipulated for human purposes. For if opinion is the realm in which civilized humans live, it is rhetoric which creates, shapes, and transforms opinion. It is rhetoric, the ability to persuade others, that is the master art. This is the key inference to be drawn from Protagoras' myth. This is what all the sophists agree on, though each of them, as I said earlier, uses the insight to serve his own particular purposes. But I haven't yet made fully explicit the real implications of Protagoras' understanding of doxa, of opinion. Reflect for a moment on what it means when he asserts that language is the first human invention, the first product of our creative capacity, and that the second is religion, the making of altars on which to sacrifice, and the feeling of grateful reverence for the divine. Language, or should I say languages, for there are many different human languages. Languages or languages permit us to talk to each other, to name and thus to recognize the commonplace material things that make up our world. And not only those things which we can point to and touch, but also the things that cannot be directly perceived by the senses. Things like justice, or the gods, or the human soul. It's even possible that through thought and discourse, we can perhaps begin to understand what's imper what such imperceptible but thinkable things really are. Language is thus the indispensable medium of thought as well as a wonderful means of communication. And it is the ability to think and to name what can't be perceived, such as a house before any houses exist, or beauty apart from all the beautiful things, that makes possible the creation of something new and the understanding of intelligible things. The realm of opinion, then, is actually the all-encompassing realm in which we live our civilized human lives. It consists of the shared fundamental opinions about what is real and what is not real, what is good and what is bad, what is beautiful and what is ugly, what is noble and what is shameful, opinions which serve as the foundation of every community, society, and culture. Even nature itself can now be seen and articulated only within the realm of opinion by humans who talk about it. It is, after all, only civilized men and women living in stable communities who can discover nature, the realm of the truly unchanging and permanent, and investigate it and discover the truth about it through careful, disciplined procedures. That is, science itself is a human artifact possible only within the context of civilized communal life. It may be true, but it is no less an artificial construct for all that. Protagoras' profound grasp of the full scope of opinion turns, turns the pre-Socratic vision of the cosmos inside out. Rather than seeing the unchanging nature of things as the encompassing whole within which we humans create their impermanent, our impermanent communities, each with its own beliefs and institutions, it is, according to Protagoras, opinion which is the encompassing whole that shapes every aspect of our lives as individuals, as members of a community, and as inhabitants of the cosmos itself. So Protagoras emerges from a thoughtful reading of his myth as a radical and profound relativist. But he seems to be a responsible and thoughtful relativist, 
well aware that our values, our deepest beliefs about ourselves, our communities, and our world are true only in the sense that they are consensually validated by our fellows. Protagoras is also appropriately discreet. He doesn't openly proclaim the truth about the relativity of all human values. For one thing, it would earn him the enmity of all those who believe the truths of their community are grounded in the natural and divine order of the world, that they are much more than a mere consensus. And even if the leaders of the communities actually do know the cynical truth, do know that the values and norms of their community are merely shared opinions, why should Protagoras reveal the truth and undercut the position and power of the elites when those elites and their ambitious young sons are his major customers? Now, there's much more to be said about this great sophist and his views of the human condition. That will have to suffice for now, but I hope you get some sense of how powerful a thinker he is. The final question that I want to address, a question I've been pointing towards throughout these remarks, is what is the Platonic Socrates response to this fundamental sophistic insight? Before I address that question, let me remind you of what the Platonic Socrates actually does in those dialogues where he shapes the conversation. The best short account that I have found is in Cicero's Tusculan Disputations, Day 5, Section 4. Cicero says there, From the ancient days down to the time of Socrates, who had listened to Archelaus, the pupil of Anaxagoras, philosophy dealt with numbers and movements, with the problem where all things came from and where they returned, and zealously inquired into the size of the stars and the space that divided them, their courses and all celestial phenomena. Socrates, on the other hand, was the first to call philosophy down from the heavens and to set her into the cities of men and bring her also into their homes and compel her to answer questions, to ask questions about life and morals, about things good and evil. And his many-sided method of discussion and the varied nature of his subjects and the greatness of his genius, which has been immortalized in Plato's literary masterpieces, have produced many warring philosophical sects. Cicero's description of Socrates' contribution to ancient thought is a standard account, almost a cliche. Yet if you think about it in the context of what I have been saying about the pre-Socratic thinkers and the sophists, particularly Protagoras, the passage takes on a wholly different look. If Cicero was right, then Socrates was the first to bring philosophy down from the heavens and into the cities and homes of men. And that means that Socrates was engaged in the same fundamental inquiry, looking for the same kind of unchanging truths that the pre-Socratics were looking for. On the other hand, if you reflect on where he looked for those truths, it becomes evident that he looked for them in the realm of doxa, opinion, exactly the realm from which the pre-Socratics turned away, but exactly what Protagoras had explored with such great power arguing that this was the unencompassing realm of human life in which everything was relative, changeable, and nothing was fixed or certain. Furthermore, the opinions that Socrates seems to have spent his life examining were precisely those opinions that Protagoras had asserted were the fundamental but relative and consensual values that formed and supported the existence of the polis and the quality of life of each individual human being. They were not opinions about the cosmos, about the stars, about the number and nature, <laughs> the, uh, about numbers and notion. They were opinions about the fundamental human values, our public and our private concerns, about life and morality, about things good and evil. So Socrates examined opinions, primarily the opinions of established Athenian citizens who seem reasonably articulate about what they believe to be the case about the things they hold most dear. His cross-examining, always has the same result. The interlocutor cannot give a coherent account of what he really believes. When Socrates encounters the sophists, the issue seems a bit different. With them, the question is, what do they claim to know and to be able to teach? Here, the difficulty is that it is almost impossible to pin the sophists down to a clear, unambiguous answer. There are several reasons for this. First, it's not in their personal interest as highly paid professionals to reveal publicly the nature of the wisdom which they sell to their paying customers. A second reason is that they are appropriately uneasy at publicly espousing a radical relativism which undercuts the authority of all the accepted norms of the community, but which they are teaching 
to the ambitious young. <clears throat> but third, and I think the most significant problem, is that the sophists don't have and don't think that there are clear and unequivocal answers to Socrates' questions about the meaning of the fundamental values of the community. They think his enterprise is doomed to fail. And in a sense, these sophists are right. The standard conclusion to a Socratic conversation is an admission of failure to establish the meaning of whatever opinion is under investigation. And the assertion by Socrates that he still knows nothing, he remains as ignorant as ever. Even when, though rarely, a Socratic inquiry seems to reach a positive answer, as it does about justice in the Republic, or about love in Socrates' speech in the Symposium, a close examination of Socrates' stated position always reveals ambiguities, uncertainties, and further as yet unanswered questions. So Socrates actually seems, at least implicitly, to accept the Protagorean view of human opinion as incapable of res resolving our questions about life and morality, good and evil. But he never abandons his project of examining those questions right up to the end of his life. However, two related insights emerge from Socrates' investigations that significantly modify the sense of inevitable failure that seems to doom his enterprise to futility. The first insight is that despite the failure to find fully satisfactory final answers to our questions, that is, despite the failure to transcend opinion and reach some objective truth, it is nevertheless clear that some opinions are genuinely superior to others. There really are stupid opinions as well as wise ones. <laughs> we may never become wise in the sense that we know the truth, but we can and sometimes we do become wiser. Even if we repeatedly have to admit at the end of a philosophical investigation of some question that we are ignorant, perhaps far more ignorant than we initially understood, our ignorance may now be grounded in an increased awareness of the complexity and far reach of the question that we had not been aware of before we explored it. So the standard Socratic failure to find a fully satisfactory answer to his and our questions is not yet an accurate measure of the failure or the success of his enterprise. The second insight grows out of the first. In the Socratic enterprise of eliciting and then investigating serious opinions, Socrates and we, his fascinated friends, not only can gain some wisdom, even if only in, in the form of, an, of a more adequate sense of our own ignorance, we may also come to learn something about ourselves, the inquirers. We are capable of seeing and accepting the inadequacies of our own and our community's opinions. That is, we can see that Protagoras and his fellow sophists, for all their clever manipulations and self-protective deceptions, have grasped some deep truths about us and the human shape of the constructed world in which we live. But we can also see, or perhaps sort of glimpse, that they stopped too soon. They were too easily satisfied with the partial truth of their relativism. From that sophistic relativism, which looks down on the simplistic pieties of most people from the, from the superior position of its sophisticated understanding of the human condition, there emerges a whole series of questions about us. What are our capacities? What does it mean that we can invent things, including notions like justice and nature? Or is it possible that such notions are not mere creations designed to serve a, a desired end, but more or less accurate perceptions and formulations of real things. After all, we do have some experience with this sort of thing. For example, take mathematics. We know that a circle is something with a very definite set of properties that are only apparently realized by the circle that we can draw on the blackboard. We know that some of the properties of the circle are very puzzling, such as the proportion between the radius and the circumference of a circle a proportion which holds for every circle, no matter how big or small, and which is a definite magnitude called pi that we can't fully express in numbers. Now, we all learned that in seventh grade, maybe earlier these days. And since then, we just take it for granted. But what does it mean that we can think about such things? What does it mean about us? What does it mean that there are such things as circles? It's hard to believe that the circle is a mere conventional creation of ours, the way a house or an automobile is. It feels more like something we have discovered, something that was already there. 
Though perhaps I, and I, and I know this language is hopelessly unclear. Let me put it this way. There are some things that we create that are really creations, fully arbitrary, but fully meaningful. The light at the street corner turns red and you stop because red means stop and green means go. But of course that's purely arbitrary. We could just as easily designate green to mean stop and red to mean go. After all, we all drive on the right, but the stupid British drive on the left. We understand that. It doesn't matter which is which, just so long as we all agree on what color to stop and on what side of the road to drive. So what is justice like? Is it a purely arbitrary set of rules to govern our interactions, which works if we all agree on the rules? Or is justice more like a circle? Not something made up for the purpose, but a real thing with the nature and specific properties of its own. So powerful that we can even sometimes say a given law is unjust. Huh? How come? What are we appealing to when we say that? These questions obviously bring us back to those great pre-Socratic philosophers. First to Parmenides, who seems to have totally rejected the empirical sense experience of the ordinary world in which we live our daily lives in favor of pure rational thought in an attempt to grasp the underlying necessary structure of being. He may have been wrong to reject sense experience, but he may well have been the first to grasp that being, the principle of reality, is accessible to pure rational thought. And second, Timaeus, in his magnificent mythical account of the extended cosmos, was able to replace the Homeric, Hesiodic vision of a strife-ridden, chaotic cosmos ruled by passionate, powerful, violent divinities with an image of a rationally, even mathematically ordered, intelligible cosmos that can make sense to us. It's called physics. And third, to the Eliadic stranger, who with his rational method of division can systematically take, tackle, I'm sorry, can systematically tackle difficult fundamental questions in a reasonably orderly, self-correcting way. Each of these three thinkers claims that reason alone can grasp and articulate something that transcends our ordinary sense experience. Parmenides uses reason to articulate the necessary structure of being. Timaeus uses reason to articulate the ordered rational structure of the extended cosmos. And the Eliadic stranger uses reason as a formal, self-correcting, standalone method for arriving at the truth of things. Protagoras, with his great discovery that we humans live entirely in the relativistic realm of opinion, throws the claims of these earlier thinkers into doubt. But what he doesn't see is that despite their dogmatism, these pre-Socratic philosophers had grasped something important about our human being in their emphasis on the power of reason. And the sophists in their turn, by failing to take reason fully seriously, exaggerate the significance of opinion and become dogmatists themselves, turning their relativistic insight into a rigid doctrine. So Socrates, who appreciates the force of so Protagoras' account of opinion, nevertheless also sees and appreciates that the pre-Socratic use of reason, even if it doesn't escape the sophistic skepticism, nevertheless points to reason itself as distinctive as a distinctive human capacity, a capacity that, surely, that we surely have but that we don't really understand. At this point, we have, with Socrates, transformed the sophistic discovery of the realm of opinion from a shrewd, comprehensive, dogmatic account of human life and into, a, into an enduring question about ourselves. It isn't fully clear what Protagoras discovered, but I think it is now obvious that he did discover something important for us. That sophistic discovery about the nature of opinion, along with the pre-Socratic exploration of the power of reason, served Socrates as the new context in which he could revise and reconfigure this pre-Socratic question of what is the underlying reality from which all things come and into which they return, the question of being. Only now he shifted the question of being and focused his inquiry on the nature and condition of us humans, the ignorant inquirers. At that point, with Socrates, philosophy took its proper form. It is still concerned with the question of being posed by the great pre-Socratics, but is now primarily directed to our being and the being of the realm of opinion, the realm in which we live, the realm first articulated by Protagoras. 
And that, I think, in the figure of Socrates, is the true and permanent image of philosophy, the fundamental human desire and search for wisdom, the rational passion that, so that Plato rendered so beautifully in his Socratic dialogues. That is who Socrates was, and that's what he did. Thank you.